Hello friends, welcome back to this channel where we explain physics concepts and read physics books. Today we bring you 5 books to help you learn classical mechanics. This is often the first topic you'll encounter if you've just started studying physics. Some of these books I've used myself as a student and they still held up quite well today. One is a popular book. Three are textbooks that have become classics, and the remaining one is somewhere in between. So we are covering all grounds today, at least with respect to classical mechanics. I'll leave some affiliated links to the books in the description below if you'd like to check them out. Now let's begin. The first book on this list has the title Infinite Powers by Stephen Strogatz who is a professor of applied mathematics at Cornell University and is also an award-winning teacher of mathematics. Those of you who enjoy reading popular science books must have heard of him, but this is the first book from him I've read. The author actually attempts to teach calculus to the popular audience, and I mean this in the literal sense. After reading this book, a layman should be able to take derivatives and solve integrals for at least some simple functions. But this is not a book about technical calculations, although it does not shy away from equations when they convey some essential lessons. More importantly, this book tells you what calculus is all about, and the author is able to boil this down into a single principle, which he calls the infinity principle that lies at the heart of calculus. This is where the book gets its name. The story is told from a historical perspective in chronological order, starting in ancient Greece with Archimedes' method of exhaustion. This is where you fit an infinite number of regular shapes into a curved shape in order to figure out its area and volume. Then we move on to Galileo Galilei, who tried to figure out the patterns in continuous motions, and to the discovery of analytic geometry, where curves could now be written down as equations. And finally, to Newton's invention of calculus, which brings the seed planted by Archimedes to fruition. Such a perspective helps the reader understand the motivations behind the discoveries that make calculus possible. In some sense, this is a more valuable lesson than just simply learning the logic of the subject, because we get to see how those breakthroughs are made. As the author emphasized, everything starts from the intuition of the explorer, just trying out new ideas and see what works without any rigorous justifications or proofs. Those come later. The reason I am talking about a calculus book in a video about classical mechanics is this. For most people coming into physics in the first or second year of college, much of the problems they encounter just involves converting a physics problem to a calculus one. Usually at this point, the problem is as good as solved. So having a solid foundation in calculus is essential for any physics student. As Feynman had said, it's the language that God talks. For this reason, I would highly recommend this book. The second book on this list gets into classical mechanics proper. This is the first volume of a series written by the famous theoretical physicist Leonard Susskind who is often considered to be one of the fathers of string theory. This series now has four volumes in total, covering classical mechanics, quantum mechanics, relativity and classical field theory, and the latest one, general relativity. Suskin has given a series of courses on theoretical physics for the continuing studies program at Stanford University that are meant for the popular audience. And this book is based on his lectures on classical mechanics. But don't be mistaken, this book presents the actual physics and not the watered-down version. It doesn't shy away from the equations that are necessary to understand the real physics. There are even problem sets in between sections to test your understanding, and some of them are not so straightforward. The book starts from the very basic, given a survey of the mathematics you'll need. Even stuff like basic trigonometry and calculus. Some elementary results, like the derivatives of function that are just simple powers of its variable, are derived, 
while other useful identities are listed for convenience. There's also a bit of integral calculus. All these are more like a reminder for someone who has taken some math classes a long time ago and is now a bit rusty, rather than a first encounter with the subject. On classical mechanics, this book also starts from the very basic, beginning first with simple systems that occupy discrete states. In fact, even time is discretized. Here, the criteria that define a dynamical system are introduced. This treatment is perhaps the most unique part of this book. This develops the general principles that run through the whole book and beyond the subject of classical mechanics. From here, we are led from the discrete to the continuum, and from kinematics to dynamics, riding precisely on the backbone of calculus, which is developed in parallel. The topics covered are breathtaking, especially for a book at this level. Newtonian mechanics is introduced, followed by the more advanced formulation of the Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics. Here you'll find the least action principle that you've heard so much about. Even the topic of the famous Poisson's brackets is introduced in the discussion about the symmetries of a dynamical system. This is probably to prepare the reader for the second volume, which is on quantum mechanics, where these brackets will play a major role. Not only that, this book goes as far as the Louville's theorem, which describes how points move in the so-called phase space, and provides an intuitive proof of the theorem. It goes even further, and derives the Lorentz force in electrodynamics, using the least action principle. This serves as an example of a velocity-dependent force. All these are covered within the span of about 250 pages, and done in a conversational style that makes for easy reading. And the author managed to accomplish this by cutting out all the excess fat and keeping just the essentials. The reader will sail smoothly through this book and make the most of it by keeping in mind its purpose. This book is just to provide you with the minimum knowledge to move on to a more complete and rigorous treatment. Thus the focus is on developing intuition rather than being careful with all the details. Those are the next steps. This is why the series is called The Theoretical Minimum. I find this piece of wisdom to be universally applicable. Always start with a short and concise introduction to a subject, rather than plunging head first into some heavy tome and getting lost in all the details. The next book on this list will be a suitable next step. The next book on this list is simply titled Mechanics by the legendary Russian physicist Lev Landau and his student Lifshiv. This book is also the first of a series, known as The Course of Theoretical Physics, conceived by Landau in the 1930s and completed by the 50s. It covers the entire spectrum of theoretical physics that a student who wished to enter Landau's research group must master. This ranges over mechanics, classical field theory, statistical mechanics, quantum mechanics, fluid dynamics, and much else. The series itself is a classic and are still among the best physics textbooks available. This is the original theoretical minimum that inspired the title of Susskind's series in the previous entry. At about 160 pages, it is an even slimmer volume than Susskind's, but provides a more complete and rigorous discussion. The book achieves this by being very economical with its explanations, saying no more than is necessary to explain a concept and getting straight to the point. Yet the author seldom made any statements that he did not demonstrate. This makes the book reasonably easy to follow if the reader is willing to do the work. This book doesn't cover the Newtonian formalism and starts straight with Lagrangian mechanics from the least action principle. This is followed by quite a bit of applications that Susskind's book didn't manage to cover. Hamiltonian mechanics is introduced in another chapter, which also contains discussions on the canonical transformations, Poisson brackets, and Louville's theorem, but with a more general and rigorous proof. This is a good follow-up on Susskind's discussion. One of the best features of this book 
is that it contains a fair amount of problems that are fully worked through, so you'll get to see how the master tackles a problem. This should pair well with Suskin's book. Moving on to our fourth entry. This is another choice for the reader who wishes to take a step up beyond the first course in classical mechanics. This is the book by Walter Grainer, Classical Mechanics on the System of Particles and Hamiltonian Dynamics. This is also part of a series which is the standard in many German universities. Though not as well known as Landau and Lifshitz, these books are a treasure trove for the discerning readers of physics textbooks. A big advantage it has over the Landau series is that it was written after the standard model of particle physics is fully worked out, and so includes more modern developments like the electroweak interaction and quantum chromodynamics. Each is covered in their own volume in the series. This is on top of the standard classical physics and quantum mechanics. At nearly 600 pages, this volume on classical mechanics is one of the heftier books on this list. It covers everything in Landau's book and beyond, with chapters on nonlinear dynamics and chaos theory. Yet you could read it like a novel from cover to cover, due to its straightforward approach and clear expositions. This is a book you could just read because the author practically fills in every intermediate steps in the calculations and thus makes it easy to follow. The other thing that makes it readable is that this book avoids long and formal discussions that run over many pages. Instead, any new concept introduced is immediately followed by a concrete example. These are sprinkled generously throughout the text. In fact, in a typical Grainer book, there may be up to a hundred examples that are fully worked out. This writing style is characteristic of all the books in this series. Since classical mechanics is a pretty old topic, the authors seem to enjoy making connections with more modern topics whenever possible. For example, when discussing the Hamilton-Jacobi formalism, its connection with the ball sommerfeld quantum theory is explained. Even for the Louville's theorem, we are told how it helped in the discoveries of the false carriers of the weak interaction. In my opinion, this book is a bit more student-friendly than Landau's and easier for self-study. The last book on our list is a long-time classic on this subject, Classical Mechanics by Goldstein, Seth Cole, and Poole. Once upon a time, it was just Goldstein, this is the book your professors probably use as a student, and most likely their professors too. While the original edition can be a bit dry, not the kind of book you'll read from cover to cover, this book has been greatly expanded with the addition of two more authors. The writing is now more student-friendly. I would put the style somewhere between Landau and Grainer. In terms of just classical mechanics, it contains more topics than Grainer, including a chapter on special relativity, plus the further development into classical field theory. Both discuss nonlinear dynamics, but Grainer has more chapters on this. Both are thick books, with Goldstein winning on a page count. I would say this is a good book for reference. You wouldn't want to read the whole thing. That's a recipe for indigestion. But anything you may want to know on this subject could probably be found here. On some elementary topics of classical mechanics, this book probably has the best explanations. You'll notice that even Greener was greatly influenced by it. Things are explained in very similar ways in some places. This is another book to consider if you'd like to go further after Suskin. We have reached the end of this video. The links to the books are in the description below. If you like this video, Consider giving a like and subscribe to this channel. And remember to press the notification bell so that you'll know when a new video is ready. See you next time and thanks for watching.